Hi, everybody. You're very welcome to the webinar. I'm delighted to be joined by Adam Whitehouse, who is theoretically is, is in a pub in Temple Bar, he tells me, <laughs> to do his talk. So how are you doing, Adam? Yeah, doing just great. <laughs> Good stuff. Great. <laughs> you know, it's Patrick's Day on um, St. Patrick's Day on Thursday. Yeah, you yeah. Well, no, I'm going to miss it. Yeah, I just I, I actually just saw it. A uh, guy from Ireland just up in the shop and he said, yeah, you should have been there for Thursday. But anyway, I'm here now. So just uh, pretend, pretend you're not there. <laughs> so like I've met you in strange places. I've, I even met people who wouldn't realise I met you on the Great Wall in China. In, near <laughs> Beijing. Hey, Eamon, that's not a good introduction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the Great Great Wall of China, I can remember that. Yeah, I've still got some photos of when we were there. So yeah, where we bump into each other. Crazy. And anyway, it's great to have you. Um, so um, back to business, I guess, in Ireland at the minute, we're growing like 60, 70 percent of our strawberry production is O'Malley and Centenary. Oh, excellent. And it's really improved over the last few years in terms of um, quality of plants and disease control and stuff. So one thing that growers are finding is that the, um, the production is really fast. So you're, you're picking for three or four weeks. So what we're always looking for is new varieties to kind of complement the Malian Centenary. So that, that's one of the main reasons I asked you, asked you to just do a quick introduction to all your varieties because you're the breeder. Um, I don't think people realize but you spend like 10 or 12 years maybe breeding one variety. That That's how long it takes to breed a variety. So you have a brilliant understanding of, of the physiology yeah. and the nutrition of the plant. Well, I assume from um, start to finish, Shaman. So it's sort of like I'm there for the cross and then like you say, it's probably about eight years just to get through the trial process and then you've got the commercialization and the and the first commercial trials and yeah it's probably about 10 years before a variety can get a sort of a name for itself but um it's relatively quick in terms of breeding i mean i'm working with guys that are working on apples rootstocks mm -hmm. which is sort of 40 50 years so you know they they never actually know if they're a good breeder or not because they're they're retired by the mm -hmm. time the uh, rootstock mm -hmm. comes out but no, but I mean, you know, we've had great success. I mean, Dave Simpson started the uh, the program back in '83. Uh, I sort of took the reins over him from from him about twelve years ago. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, when it comes to the talk, go through the talk, you'll you'll see some of the outputs. So, but I'm glad um, I'm glad Centenary is doing well for you. I mean, we have we do know of that sort of peaky production. We get that. We've been getting that um, in the southeast as well, down in in Kent, it can be very much dependent on the weather. Um, and there's uh, there's ways that you can sort of reduce it um, with your sort of uh, programming. But yeah, that is one of the, um, can be one of the downsides of centenaries, that sort of peak in, in production, it all comes at once really, so. So I'll hand over to you because you're the you're the expert here, so. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah no so problem. The show is yours. Yeah, well, um, hello everyone. Um, I, I can't see you all, but I'll um, I'll make a start. And as Eamon said, I just wanted to bring you up to date on where we are. I was last over in Ireland, I think probably about three years ago, just before COVID, um, and centenary was the real sort of talk of the town. But we we're not all about centenary anymore. We've got some new um, new varieties coming through. So um, just to give you a very brief update or quick uh, resume of what the club's about and the breeding program for those. Who don't know is, is that we're actually a um, public privately funded program um, and the program started in 1983 and uh, basically all our varieties are open um, they're not proprietary varieties um, and that's uh, really thanks to the HDB involved obviously there's been some major changes there now with the HDB um, they're actually uh, not going to continue um, but the program itself comes to an end in 2023 so we're currently looking at what the model will be beyond 2023 but we hold, have a whole raft of um, POs in there and um, propagators actually through through meiosis. Well, um, since I last spoke to you, um, and most of our trialing now is on tabletops. Uh, we still have a little bit in the soil, but we're predominantly tabletops just to match the industry now. So this is my trial site at the end of the season, very sort of full plants there. But we've also um, started to take the commercialization of our varieties in-house and uh, we've started a company called Morning Fruits and um, they've effectively taken over the portfolio that Meiosis used to have. Uh, they used to license and market our varieties. We now do that with Morning Fruits that's in-house and I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about them um, as we go through the tour. 
A couple new people on the team. Um, you may know some of these people, I'm not sure. My new head of department is a guy called Dan Sargent. Um, he uh, knows everything about strawberry genetics. He's internationally renowned with a good um, publication record. But he actually started as one of my students in the field. Uh, so he's actually become my boss now. So it goes full circle. But he's got a really thorough understanding of the whole process. And more importantly, probably, is Alan uh, Borliano, who's actually become the in-between from the breeding and the commercial um, side of things. So he's actually a technical and varieties development. So he's doing agronomic work and doing grower guidelines. So he's, he'd be good guys to look out for. And we're working with a whole raft of people on some of this agronomic work. So it's not all about what goes on at Mauling. We're working with some big players in agronomy. Um, as Eamon said, it's about eight years, the whole process. Um, we go from crosses to commercialization. The biggest part of the whole process is going through trialing and we're looking for breeding both June bearers and ever bearers. And the breeding objectives are what you pretty much expect from a breeding program. So they're, they're just laid out there. But one point of difference is, is that we do a lot of science, fundamental science that feeds into the program. Our strap line is plant science into practice. Um, and we're actually now genotyping all of our seedlings and our selections to make sure that we can look for things like crown rot resistance. Um, at the early stage, so we can get away from releasing varieties that have issues with things like crown rot. And our outputs, well, I think we're up to 48 varieties now. Um, so I think about 75% of these are still being sold somewhere in, uh, in the world. Uh, but today I'm just going to look at um, these ones, the latest releases, uh, particularly Vitality and Ace. Uh, I'll just touch on Allure Champion and Supreme. So onto the varieties. So we've just released two new varieties uh, last year at Fruit Focus. Morning Gase, which is an Everbearer, and Morning Vitality. If we start with Morning Vitality, uh, it's an early season June bearer. So actually uh, it does fit in very closely to Centenary with its season, um, but we have found it's been a little bit earlier, especially under glass. It's giving them slightly higher yield than centenary. Centenary can be a little bit fickle with its yield, but vitality seems to be more consistent. Um, but we're also um, recognizing that it's got better disease resistance. So we've got down moderate disease resistance there. It's actually um, moderately resistant to crown rot, to Phytophthora. So we see this as sort of uh, sitting in as a more robust variety uh, alongside centenary. And like centenary, it's got uh, excellent fruit display and it's got um, really sort of attractive fruit. It sort of looks a little bit orange red there. It is a little bit darker in uh, in life. Uh, actually, that's more uh, representative of it, the fruit that you can see there on the left hand side in tabletop. So as you can see, it's it comes in just a few days earlier than centenary on most sites. Under glass, we've had it actually as early as clary. Um, so on the continent, it does seem to come through as a more true early uh, when it's forced under glass. Uh, but if you look at the table, you've got a couple of trial sites there, and you can see that uh, it ticks pretty much all the boxes. Um, so percentage class one, we really rarely get anything that's less than 95% now. Um, and the yield, these are from um, tray plants, uh, is, is fairly good for an early variety. Um, it's more than break even. And actually good, bricks um, with good fruit quality scores as well. Um, this is uh, just to show um, some of the work that we had done at PCH in Belgium, where they were growing it under glass. And uh, it was up against Clary, and it actually came in at the, exactly the same season. So it did act as a true early, but it had much superior shelf life. That's the, um, the columns at the top. Uh, where you can look at vitality against clary and actually the average in the trial. So in most respects, it was much better. Um, and then when we look at uh, these radar charts, where we're looking at the fruit quality, um, again, it gave a superior score to clary. So it uh, seems to be a good all-rounder. Now, we're doing a lot of work on this variety in terms of uh, agronomic work, and this is where Alan's um, comes into play, really. Um, so we're trying to uh, provide grower guidelines for each variety as it's released. 
And so we've got a whole raft of um, agronomic trials trying to understand some of the physiology of the plant and how it responds, um, but also production systems. And you can see at the bottom there, we've got um, plant density trials uh, looking at double cropping in both autumn and spring glasshouse. And uh, actually that graph on the left just shows some propagation trials where we're looking at fertigation on the um, plants in the propagation field. So there's a whole raft of work that's going on into vitality. Okay, I'll move on to ACE. Um, this causing quite a stir in, uh, in England at the moment because it's really been seen to be an excellent ever bearer. And um, what I've been trying to do for a number of years is get an ever bearer that's got good size, good fruit display, tastes good, and has got uh, fairly good disease resistance. And uh, in fact, when I selected this one, it looked like morning centenary to me. I had the same feeling about it. Um, but it is a really, uh, it really does tick most of the boxes uh, it, for an everbearer. It seems to be a real breakthrough. And that's been demonstrated by um, some of the plant cells we've had. It's still fairly limited supply, but um, the uptake has been fantastic. I was saying to Eamon earlier, we're looking at uh, some forward cells as far forward as 2025 at the moment for this. And it's only actually been out on commercial trials for two years. So, ACE, so what's all the fuss about? Well, Here's some just data that's just been um, dragged from some of the research stations or independent trial sites. And actually this table here is from a, a couple of grower sites um, in Kent. Um, you can see it compared to Murano, um, it's uh, actually got much better um, early production. There's a little bit of a dip there, but then it picks back up. And then when we look at how it actually um, yields, this is actually two um, bars that show um, actually two different plant types of morning gaze that have been given different levels of nitrogen in the in the um, tr tray field. Uh, but what's probably quite interesting, this is work that was done by Delphi. Uh, the um, this axis shows the production um, in kilos per linear meter uh, on tabletops under under uh, under tunnels. Uh, and, and this uh, plant was actually given over 10 kilos of plant, um, which Delphi said they've never achieved before. So this is absolutely um, sort of phenomenal yield potential. And that was class one. Uh, that was 10 kilos of class one, not total. Um, and then for some of the details from the uh, guys that have been growing it in Kent, been looking at um, different plant types. So you've got a mini tray um, and then uh, a standard tray plant there, 250cc different plant densities, but again, these are looking really useful um, kilograms per plant, um, class one for an ever bearer. And this is phenomenal, hardly, you know, really low market and excellent fruit size, which has been sort of a holy grail for me as a breeder is to get a good sized ever bearer. And you can see when you look at the fruit, it looks like morning centenary <laughs> and it really is that consistent in the, uh, uh, it, uh, in production. Uh, this is just some data showing the fruit quality against Murano. Sorry, it's still down there as selection two. But again, it's really just been marked down. The, the internal color is slightly paler than Murano. And it did um, suffer in 2020 when it was a hot year with a little bit of bruising, but no, not, not significantly more than uh, Murano. So it's all a really good, uh, good story with Morning Gaze. We're really excited about it. There is one downside, though, and I have to be honest, it does have some susceptibility to powdery mildew. Um, so it's got good resistance to crown rot. Um, not seeing any issues there, but we are seeing, have seen some mildew on some sites. And just to demonstrate what we've seen, um, this is just um, some trials where we had morning ace um, in 2020 and 2021. And you can see in 2020, this uh, sort of orange colour indicates quite serious mildew infection going all the way through down to this blue line, which is no mildew at all. Um, and so the first year it was actually in commercial trial, we did find that there was uh, some serious instance of powdery mildew on some sites, although the majority had none or very light mildew. Uh, we did a bit of an investigation into that and actually those sites we found that the management of those sites wasn't particularly good 
um, and we got some guidelines together, um, spoke to all our trialists and growers. And then last year, when we had it on an increased number of sites, actually under uh, a year that was very high disease pressure, um, we found that uh, actually two thirds of the sites had none or very light mildew. So it's evidence that uh, actually, if you take a sort of reactionary, um, sorry, proactive rather than reactionary approach, to this it can be quite tightly controlled but there's more that we need to, that needs to be done on that so i will just flag that up just so you're aware so we've got a lot more work that's going on with um ace uh, again here it is you, you can see the fruit size it looks like a june bearer um but it's um we're now looking at some of the propagation and production methods we're looking at different plant types we're doing extensive trialing on mildew management including with um uvc robots and then a whole raft of physiological um, uh, work with Mark House, who some of you may have met three years ago, uh, and also looking at plant density and, and irrigation, um, because we really think that this um, variety could actually benefit from lower irrigation. Um, we, we think that's actually going to be beneficial for it, which is another, another bonus. Um, and again, this graph on the side is just some preliminary data on production from different plant types. So we've got some recommendations that we've got together. It's only been out uh, really on commercial trials for two years, so it has been fast tracked. But these are some of the probably headline recommendations at the moment or considerations if you are going to grow ACE. It's a very strong plant. It's got quite a lot of vigour, um, but actually the display is good. But we've found that uh, even if it goes into um, two-year-old bags, koi bags, it stands up really well. Um, it doesn't get um, held back. Um, I think you do need to go and de-leaf um, the plant just because it's got uh, it's a bit more sort of leafy canopy. And then we're re recommending that you probably go through just three times um, a season and probably just take two leaves off each plant. Uh, growers are telling us they probably have to do about four cuts on runners in the in the standard season. And we're um, uh, sort of getting good production actually from quite a fairly low density of planting, just sort of five or six plants per metre bag. Um, but uh, you can see, and from that photo, that the fruit is so well displayed, it's so easy to pick that we're getting about 30 to 40 kilos an hour uh, on some commercial farms. Um, with fertigation, don't go heavy on the nitrogen. <laughs> um, I think that would actually... We we're actually starting to realise, I think, that um, because people are putting it on a um, fairly high nitrogen feed, a standard feed, that uh, actually that may be causing some of the problems with mildew. And actually by reducing um, some of the irrigation and some of the um, nitrogen inputs, we seem to be getting some success in being able to better control that, that mildew and um, sort of recommending you can put silicon in the feed as well. Um, as I mentioned, uh, disease, we're not having any problems with crown rot. It seems to be very robust against that, um, that disease. But what we must say is that you've really got to be proactive in your mildew program. Um, so it, it is susceptible. You know, good ventilation, climate um, uh, 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 sort of control is, is absolutely uh, um, critical, really, to make sure that you don't have any problems. Um, I mean, this is a very quick summary, but you'll be pleased to know we've actually um, produced growers guidelines now, which is quite a comprehensive document about morning gaze. And we're going to hopefully do this with all of our varieties, which gives you all of this information and goes into some more detail with some recommended feeds and spray programs. Uh, and I'll show you where you can get that from at the end of the, the presentation. OK, I'm conscious of the time, Eamon. I don't know if I'm running a bit over. No, it's uh, fine. You're fine. It's not okay. Worries. I will just quickly touch on some of the other varieties that we've um, that we've got. Morning Alua is a late season June bearer, so that actually comes in uh, probably about seven days after Centenary. Um, I've actually just um, dragged some of the text out of the technical um, sheets that we've got on our new website, so you can see some of the information that you can get get there. It's quite. Um, concise but it gives you some can i just put in just to say to people if, if you have any questions just type them into the into the box at the bottom thanks so it's um oh that tastes really good <laughs> um but this is um this is a, a, a late season june bearer 
it actually complements um, centenary very well. And we found there's been quite an uptake uh, with some of the big grow groups in the UK, um, because especially where the, there's been a peaky production with centenary, um, a Lewis fitted in very neatly um, after centenary and before the everbearers start to kick in. So the uptake on this variety is increasing. Um, again, you can see, uh, you know, what I'm trying to do is get a portfolio of centenary like fruit. So it's got that um, very a uniform appearance, very large fruit size, and very easy to get to. It has got a little bit of susceptibility to crown rot, not as much as um, uh, centenary. And actually, the um, mildew for a late season variety is fairly good, so it doesn't it doesn't usually have uh, too much of an issue. Um, and this is what it looks like in glass production. So again, it's just really fast to get to, really easily displayed, um, and it's uh, it's it's getting a lot of interest. Uh, interestingly, it's got a lot higher bricks than centenary as well, so it's it's certainly perceived to be sweeter. So it, it doesn't fall down on the, the fruit quality. Uh, that's just some data just showing um, how it compares actually to our Santa. That was back in 2017 when we first saw it. So you get an idea of, uh, of sort of the, the season. You can actually see on, in Perth, that's the Scottish site. So uh, that's actually with Berry Gardens. It was really was much later, uh, sort of almost uh, 12, 13 days later, the peak pick. We found it's, it's, yeah, it's very late, very, very, very late. But that can okay. suit some people. It all depends on your production plan on the farm yeah i think it i think when it's been forced through you can see in kent there it's only uh, just about seven seven days but uh, i'd say no, it normally fits in about 10 days generally right have you how have you found the variety has it been okay have you uh, it suited some people it, it might have picked it, it came in late but it picked for a very long time mm -hmm. and for depending on your production plan some people they didn't just have enough volume of fruit from it and okay. over that period, but it suited some other people because it complemented centenary or some other variety. So, um, yeah, we're finding that there's there's certainly some grower groups are, are, are really going for it, and others are just sit, uh, not so sure really. But um, some of the bigger grower groups are really um, taking it on board now. Right. Um, and then Champion and Supreme. I don't know if you've had an experience of these um, these varieties. There has been some, yeah. So champions are really robust. Well, in fact, both of these are really robust in terms of disease. Um, so uh, we, we don't get any issues with uh, disease on either of these. They're very strong. Um, champion has got really good um, yield potential, um, sort of, uh, eight to nine uh, kilos per linear metre. Um, and it's really um, uh sort of uh, generative it really wants to um, uh, kick uh, flowers out and we actually find it's very early um, this uh, picture here is just from Mark House's wet center at East Malling and you can see it's absolutely loaded with uh, fruits with lots of flower coming through um, we've been looking at different plant types because we're finding it gets a very early peak and then it can just tail off and sort of dribble a little bit it's an everbear isn't it yeah, sorry, these are both ever bearers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it seems to be very sensitive to temperature. If we get a hot year, that's not a good morning champion year. Uh, last year, uh, when it was a bit um, sort of cooler, uh, it was brilliant. We've had some really good um, yields off it. So it's uh, very uniform, excellent shelf life. It travels well. Flavour can be a little bit weaker than Centenary, than Supreme. It's a more sort of um, standard mainstream variety. Um, and size can go a little bit small if it gets warm. I think those, those are two things to probably look out for. But again, we're working with Mark to see uh, how we can get the best um, growing conditions for those. But it's certainly a very robust and productive variety. Supreme is another ever bearer. And um, we've sort of held back on this one a little bit because it's got a, a slightly... Um, more squat, uh, globose, conic shape, which we don't normally go for at a smalling. I mean, that primary berry, you can see the size of it, and that's very good. Um, but the outstanding thing about Supreme is the um, consistency in BRICS levels over the season. Uh, so if you look at that chart there, that's actually weeks um, along the bottom, and then 
uh, actually average bricks um, as you got the uh, uh, the x axes, and these are just different plant types. Um, so that's the difference between the the actual lines. They're just different plant uh, plant types. But you but you can see all those a bit bit of um, sort of peaks and troughs. That's actually fairly consistent for an everbearer. And we're finding that this is probably going to have some success in a more top tier, um, sort of taste the difference sort of range. Um, production wise, uh, it's slightly inferior to Champion, um, but still, uh, st still uh, sort of, you know, seven, uh, seven kilos per linear meter. Um, so it's, it's, it's still a, a, a doer. It does well. And quickly, I just want to go through and just tell you about some of the other stuff that we've got coming through. Um, this is um, along the top is some of the standard varieties for different seasons for June bearers. And then just here, I've got listed by year some of the new selections that we've got going through the system. And you can just see that we're trying to sort of attack all uh, sections of the of the market with early's, early mids, all the way through to late. So we don't sit on our laurels. We carry on trying to produce what we can. Um, I apologise for the photos of 2910. It's come out pixelated. It's that good. We have to um, sort of disguise it. <laughs> but um, these are just some varieties that are going through trials at the moment. And again, you can just see looking at the photos, just the quality of them, um, especially this 2836. It's phenomenal. Um, uh, and you've got some data there. Just compare it to Centena in terms of yield. 2622 is a very sweet late season variety. Um, probably later than the Allure, actually, but again, very good quality. And 2910, I'm sorry about the photo, but uh, we saw this last year. Um, and effectively, it's uh, like centenary, probably slightly shorter trusses. Every, in every other respect, it ticks the boxes but it's got good crown rock resistance, or so we think it has at the moment. So that'd be certainly one to, to look, for, uh, look forward to in trial to see how we get on with it. And then for everbearers, slightly smaller pool, uh, but that's because we put less emphasis on everbearers. But again, just to give you um, an idea of what's coming through. Um, 704 uh, looks quite seedy, but actually that's been doing really well in Scotland for early production and large fruit size and very good flavour. Uh, so there's interest in that. Uh, 794, again, it looks like a June bearer, as does 863. And you can look at some of the yield here compared to Murano and Champion. You can see that we're really starting to push through now on both yield and quality. Uh, and then these were just two more that have come through. I've included 925 uh, because it's such a beauty. Um, EMR 796 is Morning Gase on that chart. Um, so this one's actually got quite a late season. We were running it through some trials to see if that was just a one-year effect. But, I mean, if you look at the, the berries, they're just uh, fantastic. Really, really uh, a good good fruit. 965, it's a bit more um, sort of blotchy around the necks, but again, it's had a fantastic um, yield. And in fact, if you look at it against morning ace, it's not significantly different. So we're really trying to push now on yield with everbearers. You know, we can sense there's a, a, more of a move towards everbearers uh, production um, and really just to be able to get that yield is now key for us in the fruit size. Okay, um, so as a programme though, there's a whole raft of things that we're looking at. Like I say, the club's going to sort of be reborn in 2023 uh, when the current tranche of funding comes to an end. But, you know, as breeders, as Eamon said, we've got to be thinking eight to 10 years ahead. Uh, uh, the variety that we'll look at next year uh, will be out in a market in 10 years' time, 10 or 12 years' time. So we're looking at all sorts of different things, climate change, new pests and diseases, how production systems are going to change, uh, how we can change things with some of the science that we've got, uh, and even where we can work in the, in the world. You know, we've been very Northern European-centric um, what else can we do? And of course, uh, all this mess at the bottom to do with <laughs> Brexit seems like a long time ago. Uh, there's been a lot more gone on since then, but uh, labour requirements haven't got any uh, easier and uh, an automation is something that we're 
seriously looking at as, as breeders, we need to, because we need to understand what's going to happen. So um, just to reiterate, uh, all our varieties now have been commercialised and licensed through Morning Fruits. We've got a website. Um, and in fact, when I, I'll click on that, so I, don't, I can't click on it while I'm, I'm on full screen. I'll click on that shortly just to show you what, what it's all about. But if you visit that website, you'll have all of the information on all the different varieties, where you can buy plants from, who the licensed propagators are, the technical sheets, and where there are grow guidelines, the grow guidelines. So it's fairly comprehensive. And I just wanted to say thanks to all my team, um, who, you know, I'm always at the forefront and get these great gigs um, sitting in my um, front room pretending I'm in Dublin <laughs> drinking <laughs> drinking Guinness but there's all these people in the background that don't even get that so um, I just want to say thanks to them and uh, and also just uh, say happy St Patrick's Day for Thursday uh, I think that's a, that's one way to ruin a strawberry but there you go but um, God what's what's that it looks like some strange salad it's uh, I don't like it it's ruined it uh, Eamon, if I can just very quickly just show you this. Um, uh, let me just uh, show you this, the uh, morning uh, the morning fruit site. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just so we can just see. Can you all see that? Can you see that? Okay. Yeah, I can see what you're clicking on. Yeah, yeah. So basically, we've now got this website. It's on the NIAB page, but it's under morning fruits. And then if you, if you click in here, you've got your... Um, You've got your propagators all here. You can click straight on, get in touch with them. So you've got a list of all, all the propagators. Uh, you scroll down. You've got technical sheets there. We can't see this now, but... Um, oh, you can't? No, for some uh, reason. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. And you've got guidelines there. But definitely, um, definitely go to that website and pick up your grow guidelines from there. They're very comprehensive. A lot of work has gone into them, so... Okay. Brilliant. Thanks a million. Um, there's no questions yet, but I have a few. Okay. Um, the, the Everbear trials, did you do those? Um, were they all done in Kent or were they done up the country? Uh, so the Everbear trials, we do them all over, Eamon. So okay, we've got, okay. uh, because of the club membership, um, the club members, uh, part of their membership is to actually do the trials. Um, and so, um, I'll just get rid of this, sorry. And so we get... Um, what we do is, is that we um, send them all over the UK, um, so actually not to Ireland, that's one place we don't send them at the moment, but to Scotland, uh, the West Midlands, uh, East Anglia, uh, and in Kent. But because we've got all the um, continental members as well, we trial them in Holland, Belgium, uh, we've got sites in Spain, um, France, Germany, Poland, um, and then we've actually uh, got Norse farms in the US that we work with as well. So some of this material has actually um, gone over to the Northeast states as well. So it's fairly comprehensive trialling. Um, it's for us, the Everbearers, having them on the continent is really important because the continental climate uh, it puts them under that sort of um, heat uh, so we can then assess them for things like heat tolerance and thermodormancy. Um, so that's why we're working with Delphi quite closely because their site's just on the German border and uh, that gives a real good test for the Everbearers in terms of, of heat tolerance. And you know the, the primary genetic material, are they based on Californian type um, short day material or long day material, I mean? Are they from the ever bearers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, if you think that um, it was really the seventies that they really came to a fore, didn't they? The sort of uh, well, the day day neutrals really. Um, but I mean, there were ever bearing varieties in Europe that were kicking around uh, start of the twentieth century. So there's some French varieties, but um, a, most of our material probably has got origin going back to California. I think most of them have. It's such a small gene pool. Um, I mean, what we have done at East Smalling and has been quite successful to improve fruit size and trust morphologies is actually um, just uh, cross with June bearers. Um, uh, and so you actually start to integrate some of the quality and the fruit size um, traits from June bearers into the other bearers. 
Uh, oh, but you, you've got to, yeah, you've got to understand your segregation, your inheritance to do that. Otherwise, you just you you you, uh, you end up with a lot of dune bearers in your in your progeny. So, I mean, that's part of the work that was done about the molecular genetics is actually being able to um, predict which lines are homozygous for ever bearing, so that when we do cross them, um, we um, we can get uh, confidence that the majority of the families or seedlings are going to be ever bearers, even though they're being outcrossed to a to a short day time. So there's a little, little bit of uh, jiggery pokery there. But and does the fact that the ever bearers are coming from being bred, say in Kent, does that give an advantage for growers in? The northwest of Europe that they actually performed fairly okay versus if you plucked one from California. Yeah, it's 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 different. Uh, you, yeah. I mean, you, I mean, if you yeah, if you, I mean, we we often trial some of the. Um, I mean, we used to trial things like Albion, um, Diamante, and things like that. And you know, they had a had a sort of a, a, a place. They were they, they never really seemed to have the vigor that we would get um, from some of the. Uh, northern European bread material but a lot of them were, were bred as well for shipping um, so you know going from um, sort of upstate and and so things like Albion were and Diamante were always real tough cookies they were like apples so that, that's been the major thing for us is just trying to get that fruit quality down but, um, I mean you know if you've got a day neutral you know it's going to have a lot of adaptability in, in, a, in, in a lot of places but I mean, you know, I think a lot of what we've got coming through is more long day ever bearing, really, because that um, some of that European stock and some of the um, short days that are coming through. OK, well, that's it. That's really important. Like the fact that the yeah the material. So there's a much better chance of those ever bearers working in our maritime climate versus um, the Californian. Yeah, climate. I mean, it, this is the thing, though, is, is that the, the you know, because of the change when we've, you know, we found that we champion when you get these very hot um, periods that things do close down and you get sink like Murano, uh, which has come, you know, from the Po uh, Po Valley seems to be a lot more resistant to the heat. So that's why it's important for us to be testing our stuff on the continent in the expectation that, you know, we're going to get hotter summers and that, you know, if we're growing under tunnels, we're going to put a lot more pressure on the, on the plants. So, yeah, we can't just rely on screening in in uh, in the southeast. We've really got to look at it everywhere. I think champion champion sounds interesting. Our cool climate would be worth trying as well, as well as the other ones. Yeah, de- definitely. Fine. Yeah, I mean, champions it is very productive. I mean, I think if we hadn't have had Ace following on, Delphi thought it was absolutely cracking for its production, um, and I think the auction houses seem quite happy with it when they saw it as well because it's just such a, a good uniform berry um and it, and it travels well but ace has kind of eclipsed it a little bit in terms of um <laughs> fruit size and and yield and yeah. can that be bought from the typical um english or dutch propagators I presume ace well they, they don't have the availability i'd say but yeah no you can go directly to the propagators for it so it's all publicly available so ACE, um, it's still building up stocks. I mean, it was only, it was fast tracked. It's only really been out on, on commercial sites for two years. So I don't, I don't think we've ever moved so quickly on a variety. Um, but there are a lot of propagators out there. But we're still probably only looking at about two, uh, two and a half million plants for next year, mm-hmm. which is quite is quite low. I mean, if you think with centenary, we're selling almost. 65 70 million plants a year now okay. so we're really ramping up um ace trying to get there there's a lot of propagators involved but because it's still really only within its probably second or third year of being pushed through it, it's going to take time to build up but uh okay. and you know the way you said a lot of it is did you say a lot of the english growers are switching over well they're moving more towards everywhere production it's probably because of costs and stuff yeah, we're getting. Um, it's a little. Uh, it depends on who you talk to, and it, uh, but I generally, I think there's more of a push towards um, ever bearers now. I think that the quality uh, has, has improved, and then it's the economics of just you know putting a single planting in. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you, yeah. you, you know, some guys are using 
um, uh, sort of heated uh, heated tips, and they're sort of uh, putting them in very early and going for a fairly steady sort of production pattern without getting this big peak and then um, that sort of trough in production. Um, but yeah, there seems to be a bit more push from some of the larger growers in the UK to, to go to over more towards ever bearers. And I think I think that's the way it's going to go. Yeah, yeah. The economics rather than planting twice and all the associated costs for planting once makes yeah, I think total the, sense. I think the only thing that's that's going to be a, an issue is is that obviously you're still going to have that peak in demand in June, um, sort of at start of July, so the traditional season. Yeah, yeah. And 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 you know, with a June bearer, you know you can meet that demand. With a never bearer at the moment, unless we, we can get a bit more smart with sort of the um, program cropping. With an ever bearer, that's always going to be a bit of a risk. Yeah, that's a really important time of year. That May or late May, June is because yeah. it's the beginning of the season, that's when a lot of people make their most a lot of their income is in June. Yeah, so, so I think I think that's that's going to be the catch. Um, but you know, people get more savvy with what they're doing with um, production methods and systems. So I wouldn't think it was um, beyond sort of the wit of man to, to do it. And I think with something like Ace, where it, it, it does keep on kicking out fruit, um, you can, you should be able to do something with that. Have you any stock that people can do any small trial? Or do you have any stock available? We, we could even do a, a trial on Ace. Uh, yeah, I've, I've not got any, but there may be some kicking around with the propagators. Okay. I think okay. um, I can speak to Alan tomorrow because he's, he's coordinating just see if there's any, any material kicking there. Kicking around, um, it may just be the dregs at this time of the year. If, if it yeah, is, but, but I mean, even if you you can get some in there, um, yeah, I'll check with Alan and get back to Jamin and see what's okay. what's about. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, like I say, it's available. Um, it's just whether there's any any decent material still there. I think everyone's snapped mm-hmm. it up. Listen, that's there's no questions. People are very quiet. That's all right. It's my oh, soporific um, voice. Looking forward to seeing it. Fruit focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be there July. So back in uh, back in person. So if anyone's going to Fruit Logistica, I'll be there. I'll be in Berlin in uh, in in uh, April, start of April as well. So yeah, just come and say hello, and I'll look forward to catching up with you then. So if my boss is watching Berlin, Berlin, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm there for the first two days of Logistica. So oh. yeah, just uh, you'll come and find us. We've got a stand there. And they do just pop on that website. It's it's really good. It gives you a lot of yeah, information. Brilliant. So, brilliant. Thanks for all your information. And um, yeah, yeah, this well, is available. For- An- anybody that's wondering, the the videos are all up on our Chalkus Horticultural website under webinar section now. So, if you want to watch Adam again, you're very welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> occasionally, your video from the last time I was there crops up. People remind me. I think it's before I had a beard. I think I've got a little bit hairier since I last saw you all. Blame, yeah, blame yeah, COVID yeah. for that. But uh, okay, well, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks. Thank for, you very much. Enjoy uh, your night there in the pub. So happy St. Paddy's Day for uh, for the end of the week. <laughs> thanks very much. Enjoy your night. Yeah. Cheers. See you, everyone. Bye, everybody. And no one mentioned the rugby. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Good luck. <laughs>